Hello, everyone. Welcome to our transatlantic online discussion on discrimination by moderation, how to address gender and racial bias in content moderation. My name is Zora Siebert, and I'm head of the EU policy program at the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Brussels. The Heinrich Böll Foundation is a political foundation affiliated with the German Green Party. Our primary task is political education and advocacy in Germany and abroad. We place particular emphasis on gender democracy and diversity at our work. This event and the two reports you're going to hear about are a joint project of our Brussels and our DC offices. Today, we will focus on content moderation. So content moderation is the monitoring and vetting of user-generated content, for example, on social media. These complex systems rely on the one hand on the removal of undesirable content and on the other hand on the amplification of other content. Worldwide, concerns are growing regarding the impact for freedom of expression caused by content moderation. Unfortunately, it has been proven wrong many times that the internet is a peaceful space for equity and peaceful communication. The spread of hate speech and disinformation on social media are serious threats to our democracies. And we want to do something about that with you. We're in the middle of the EU discussions around the Digital Services Act, the new law for platform regulation. And in the US, there's a similar debate on the reform of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Today, we want to provide the basis for a discussion with the two reports for a transatlantic and global, fairer and more inclusive online ecosystem. We look forward to hear from the two authors, Brandeis Marshall and Christina Dinar, but also from our panelists, MEP Timo Wölken and Shakira Smith from the Salty Algorithmic Bias Collective. The representatives of big social media platforms unfortunately did not accept our invitation. Jennifer Baker, a freelance tech and digital rights journalist, will be moderating the debate today, and I'm very much looking forward to that. And with this, I pass over to you, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Sora, for the kind introduction and indeed to the Heinrich Böll Stiftung for organizing today's event. Um, as Sora said, the title, the title of today's event is Discrimination by Moderation, How to Address Gender and Racial Bias in Content Moderation. Now, as you've heard, we are going to hear the two reports from the report authors from either side of the Atlantic. So do keep your ears pricked up for that. And then we will have, be joined by our other two panelists to do have a panel discussion. Now, the Q&A function is at the bottom of your screen. So please do use that to send your questions to our panelists. I'm going to run through quickly a little bit of housekeeping first. You will also see at the bottom of your screen an option for interpretation. Now we're simultaneously in English and in German today. So you can use that. It's a globe shape and you can select off or you can select English or you can select German. So please do that. I should say, of course, the event is being recorded today and you will be able to find it at to the fact on the uh, YouTube channel of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Uh, it is uh, also a chat function that is available to you there. Please do keep that for chat, but if you want to share links to various papers that you think might be useful to, uh, to inform the discussion, do so there. Just keep the Q&A specifically for questions to our panelists. I would ask you if it's for specific panelists, put that in the question so I know who to direct the question to, or, or if it's for everyone, you can just leave it open. If you could try to be concise uh, and in full sentences, that would make my life a lot easier, which I'm always very grateful for. So with that, you are going to hear from Christina Dinar first, who is a freelance lecturer and trainer on anti-discrimination strategies online, anti-racist conflict resolution, digital competences, democratic debating culture and democracy promotion among young people. Now, as deputy director at the Center for Internet and Human Rights, Christina led the research project Democrative Meme Factory. And she's also worked on content management um, as a, a, at Wikimedia in Germany. So the first report you're going to hear presented by Christina is the state of platform moderation for the LGBTIQA plus community and the role of the Digital Services Act. So starting with this on this side of the Atlantic, Christina, thank you so much. I hand over to you. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks very much uh, for that kind uh, invite and this possibility to 
write it, I will speak in German. Also, ich berichte kurz zum, zu dem, äh, was ich geschrieben habe. So, I would like to just uh, summarize what I have written in the report. I talked about the LGBTIQA plus community and the role of the Digital Services Act. I'm just going to summarize it. If you want more information, then please go to the report. Now, the report concentrates on marginalized communities and how they're discriminated against in content moderation. We also look at the scientific background and look at two examples of how people in these communities are negatively affected by content moderation. At the same time, the internet is still a space for empowerment, for visibility, and for networking. The first example which I would like to mention is uh, Planet Romeo, which is a dating network for gay, bi, and trans people. It is a platform that was founded during the Web 1.0 era. And one of the examples for why it is being discriminated against is that since 2011, it has been censored various time and removed from the Google App Store because uh, machines decide whether an application can be shown there or not. This obviously has economic consequences, but also, and above all, social consequences for the community. Google has not answered any of our questions. Then there's another example of another network uh, called Salty, a newsletter for women. Shakira will talk about this um, project, which is very interesting. And in this community, Shakira has encouraged the members to collect any posts that were deleted, especially content by people of color, whose content is then flagged as escort services, but also, for example, pictures of uh, trans people. So anything that couldn't be clearly identified in accordance with heteronormative standards was deleted. The report also provides suggestions and proposals of how to solve this. I can give you a few examples. Of course, I'm looking forward to any other suggestion. One of them, for example, is that uh, Gay Romeo moderates very closely with the community and even involves the community. It uses a model which interacts with the community. So there's no artificial intelligence or there are no automated decisions here because it always operates very closely with the community. The report also recommends how to approach marginalized groups as well, especially groups uh, which suffer more under uh, from, viola from violence against them, for example. So what are my proposals? The civil society has to be taken into account much more users online, for example, but also me individual members of this group, of these groups, for example, through um, different um, identification processes of accounts. I also propose and su suggest social media councils, which can give recommendations, which in turn can then be implemented by these platforms. So once again, civil society is involved in this suggestion. We need a diverse digital ecosystem in which we then operate. So this must go beyond just platforms. So legislation mustn't simply punish, which is something that is kind of suggested by the law. No, it should underline and underscore 
community moderation and involvement of the community and, and then also promote this. Another aspect is education. It's also very important for users to know what rights they have. And it's always very important for users to know what they can do. If they don't, then, well, this wouldn't be useful. I'm looking forward to the debate now. Thank you very much for giving me time to give a brief summary. Thank you very much, Christina. As you may guess, I'm, of course, listening in English, so waiting for our very capable translators to finish your translation. Uh, and, and just a reminder to people that if they do want to look at that report in full, the link is there in the chat. Now, our second report is going to be presented by Brandeis Marshall, a computer science scholar and educator who focuses on data engineering and data science. She is currently a professor of computer science at Spelman College and a practitioner fellow with Stanford University Digital Civil Society Lab. And she's also the founder of DataExt. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I'm sure Brandeis will be able to help me out. An executive training firm focused on enhancing the workforce's data competencies. Now, the report we're going to be talking about is Algorithmic Misogynoir in Content Moderation Practice, which explores the discrimination faced by Black women in the United States. Brandeis, thank you so much. We look forward to hearing from you this morning. So over to you. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Jennifer. And it's data at X. Um, no worries at all. We didn't go over it before we got online. Thank you so much for having me. I am so happy to be here and so look forward to the conversation as we talk through content moderation um, algorithmically as well as um, human content moderators. So I would like to start my summary and my, re my remarks with um, Moya Bailey. And she is the woman who coined the term um, massage noir. And this term really is about anti-Black racist misogyny that Black women experience particularly. And one of the reasons on why I want to start here is because there is an algorithmic approach to this massage noir that I am uh, investigating and examining inside of my e-paper. And this really builds upon um, uh, Bailey's description to identify how interactions online play out not only in code, but also um, as a result of the algorithmic and automated decision systems for particularly Black women. Inside of the paper, I wind up providing two very concrete examples, um, and you can read it more fully in the paper, but in each one, Black women are responding to certain posts online, one on Facebook and one on Twitter. Their statements wind up being flagged as being harmful content or some type of hate speech, and their content was removed, yet the original post that they were responding to that also was problematic remained online and remained online for many, many months. So as an alternative to how we deal with how Black women are viewed online, it is a direct um, mirror or mimic of how Black women are seen in the physical world. So I frame a lot of my comments on the existing public value failure framework. This is part of science policy that really is about articulating nine different categories, won't get into all the categories, but the whole point is to delineate society's failures in providing some sort of public value. And that public value is rights, uh, benefits, or privileges of its citizens. And that is what Black women are looking for to embodying fully inside of our society. How can we be seen as fully human and make sure that our dignity is maintained online and as well as in the real world. So this framework um, helps tease out um, some of the ways in order to make the internet safer. So yes, the internet does provide a wonderful way in order for us to communicate, to share, to 
connect with each other, but it also is a place where we have been bullied, we have been oppressed, our opinions have been pushed to the side, we have been erased from certain um, conversations and discussions. So there's a couple of recommendations that I put forth in this work, and it really is on the technical end, because of course I'm no legal scholar. But as part of the recommendations, it's really is looking for transparency, very much similar to some of the work that um, Christina has, has already mentioned. But in addition to all of those recommendations, it's really looking at um, backtracking in, pro in, in content moderation strategy, which really is if there happens to be some type of flag content, then make sure that you are looking at the original post as well to see if that content is problematic. And then there is the second corollary to this type of strategy, which is propagation that I'm proposing. And propagation is making sure that if the original post is problematic, look at all of the posts um, that have uh, been of, of response. So hopefully that provides a little bit of a background, a little bit of a framing for what I'm proposing moving forward. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation on how we <laughs> can make sure that content is moderated for all people to be inclusive as well as to be equitable. Thank you. Thank you very much Brandeis and to our attendees once again, you can find the link to that full report and the full study in the chat. So please do follow that and share it with your colleagues and, and your friends as well. Now, with that, I'm going to invite our other two panelists to switch on their cameras. As we mentioned already, Shakira Smith, Research Director at Salty Algorithmic Bias Collective, is joining us. And Salty is a 100% independent, membership-supported newsletter buoyed by the voices of women, trans, and non-binary contributors from all over the world. Shakira, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, you're a practitioner advocate and a dual PhD candidate at Indiana University. So thank you. Timo Wilken, MEP from Northern Germany, a member of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, the S&D group in the European Parliament. And Timo is the shadow rapporteur for the opinion of the Legal Affairs Committee on the Digital Services Act. Uh, I know that's very technical for those of you joining us from the US, but suffice to say that he will be combing through that new act with a fine tooth comb. Timo, thank you very much for joining us. Shakira, let me start with you and, and get your initial reaction to the two reports that, uh, that the ladies were speaking about and what your take is and how you react to and, and where you dovetail with what they're saying. Sure. Um, I want to make one small clarification from Christina first, uh, and that was just to say that um, Salty's first survey and first report was very much uh, a grassroots effort. So I came on um, after that. They did all that work on their own and with the community. Um, and I've just joined recently to lead, let's say, like the next phase of their surveying. Um, but as far as the reports, you know, I feel like this is um, a really nice affirmation of folks, you know, experiences online. Um, one thing I appreciated was the emphasis on transparency in platforms, or let's say um, the lack of transparency. I think that this ends up doing double harm uh, to marginalized folks. So first, they experience censorship, uh, and then there's gaslighting about what they experienced or that saying that they didn't experience that at all. Um, so something that I've really been hoping for in coming to Salty's team and that I feel is really affirmed here um, is that publishing our survey data as um, open source and disaggregated as possible is gonna be really useful. And it's useful because um, that data doesn't exist elsewhere yet. Um, the recommendation uh, from Christina to add identities in the reporting, particularly around queer, uh, disabled and body positive concepts um, is something that I feel really aligns with our work um, and is certainly a top priority in our next survey and the reports that are going to come afterwards. So thank you for that. Thank you, Shakira. Uh, Timo, let me turn to you. You're hearing there about a lot of these reports and a lot of the suggestions are leaning towards transparency. What's your take uh, initially on what you're hearing? 
Yes, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, I think both reports touch upon a very important issue. So the automated tools used by platforms today to police content are imperfect and often biased. Um, and this is not a new problem, of course. Uh, we have discussed this here in the European Parliament in detail as part of the discussion on the copyright directive, for example. And uh, what I would like to underline is that it is, is uh, especially important when we talk about uh, very sensitive issues of fundamental rights and discrimination. So for me and for many of us here in the parliament, one thing is absolutely clear. So we should not stand by while people are subjected to digital violence. So there has to be efficient redress reporting mechanisms, and of course, a transparent decision making on part of the platforms, which we, so at the moment, we don't have any insights. And as Brenda's uh, report has shown, automated tools um, often have a built-in bias, and I believe they will still make such mis mistakes, even with regulatory monitoring, auditing, and improvement of those the, these tools, which the DSA, for example, the proposal by the commission suggests. So this is why we should be very careful how much we really want to trust these tools and trust platforms and others who tell us we need to use them. So and I also wanted to stress one thing, no matter how, how hard we try uh, a perfect content moderation system is, from my perspective, impossible. So we have to try and strike the right balance between allowing, on the one hand, uh, free debate and exchange with an adequate protection from digital violence, of course, uh, and especially for vulnerable groups. For instance, if we make platforms liable for everything that happens on their platform, they are sure to delete a lot of content that was never illegal or even harmful in the first place, just to cover their backs. So this is always a danger. And instead of focusing on liability, I think we should focus on, as I said, redress, reporting, and very, very important transparency, as well as a strong role for civil society, of course. And on this, I, I fully agree with uh, the recommendation, recommendations by Christina. Well, thank you for that. Um, and of course, what we're talking about the DSA is the Digital Services Act. Um, I'm going to go to Christina now. We'll stay a little bit with the, the European proposals, of course, for the moment for today. Uh, we already have in Europe uh, general data protection regulation. That includes in it uh, the requirement to inform people if any major decision that affects their lives or could affect their livelihoods is taken by an algorithm or by computer learning or, or by AI. I mean, that's for major decisions that might impact you. We're talking about content moderation, Christina. Do you think there is enough teeth in the current proposals? Or do you think we're looking at what Timo says here, that the point that we may see over moderation or over, overly zealous takedowns of legitimate content, thus infringing freedom of speech or freedom of expression? Um, was ich ganz interessant finde an der Debatte ist What so I found very interesting in this debate is that the users, are, the female users, are a little bit forgotten in all of this and what it does to them in particular. Rights are important and they are being mentioned and strengthened in the Digital Services Act, but I see a strong need here that there needs to be a lot more teeth to this and that these teeth have to be on the side of the people who are out there every day uploading content every day uh, discussing the, discussing these things every day and what i'm missing in this is that this draft of this act is not really oriented towards the needs of the people and their need for protection and their rights now i'm coming from germany where we have the nets dicky uh, which is more or less a pioneer, which is really a first attempt. What, what happens when, where you can see what happens when you regulate this, where you can, you have a lot more possibilities to report things. 
and I don't know how many people are even aware this exists, uh, are aware where the report buttons are, how this platform can actually be used, that the platforms have really hidden those reporting options, that everything had, has had to go through the community guidelines. This, of course, has led to a confrontation between user groups and communities, and that this comp uh, comparison doesn't happen, be it on a legal level or be it on the platform level. I would just like to see more of this, but of people being more involved directly. This can be part of community management, or as Timo said, it can be an effort of including civil society as a whole more. To, uh, and also to reward this more. Currently, what I see in the service like this is mostly targeted towards the platform and they will have to do something, but many things will be forgotten. Smaller platforms and the people and the communities out there, most of all. Thank you. Well, Christina, um, you mentioned community guidelines. So, Brandis, let me come to you. One of the debates we often have is whether we want these big platforms to be the sole arbiters of what is and isn't appropriate to say. So going by community guidelines rather than laws made by politicians elected by society may not be the right way forward. What do you think of the, the efforts you see on both sides of the Atlantic to try and address this in legislative terms versus what can be done on a self-regulatory basis? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, in, when it comes to legislation, it can only go so far to Christina's point. I mean, legislation is all about trying to set a, a guardrail or a boundary, but it does not actually provide enforcement. And that is what is really necessary is how is the enforcement going to work? Um, when it comes to centering the most vulnerable populations, that's why we're having this discussion, because what happens inside of these platforms is that the most vulnerable are invisible. But then when there is an attack or there is moderation that is severe, then all of a sudden they're hyper visible. This is something that we've seen over and over again. I mean, the work of Shereen Mitchell when it came to the to the 2016 elections and how there was disinformation targeting black communities in order to push the vote in one direction, trying to do their best in order to take on the personalities of black women in particular in order to push forward a political agenda. So when it comes to big platforms and their regulation, that's one level, but really legally, we really need to have an oversight that includes all people, um, but to also make sure that the people who are oppressed aren't the people who are therefore instructed in order to solve the harms. So we really need the dominant community in order to make that organizational shift and prioritize um, minimizing harms and minimizing them both the legal harms as well as the social harms. Shakira, the same question or same point to you and to give me your reaction. Are we on the right track with this uh, legislative approach? Oh, no, of course. Um, I agree uh, with Dr. Marshall that right, legislation sets up a boundary. And then I think that... Um, the difficult for part for me is enforcement. Like, what does that look like? Um, who is going to end up being punished? Because I agree with Timo that I think that process very likely becomes um, a CYA approach where everything gets deleted um, and we end up perpetuating even more of what's happening already. Um, I think that uh, Christina's recommendations of decentralization and involvement and the community to participate in regulation, at least in uh, some capacity is certainly, you know, a start in the right direction. Um, but I think that maybe what Dr. Marshall was getting at about like involving uh, folks who are outside of the dominant culture, who are not just white men um, running platforms and making the policies also become slippery, right? Because if that community is all dominant and there's no culture shift, then I certainly as a black woman do not want to be in that space. That's additionally harmful for me. So how can we shift the culture and involve the community in a way that doesn't do further harm? 
Timo, let me come to you, um, not wishing to blame you personally, but the European Parliament isn't the most diverse place in the world. Um, gender, certainly racially, um, but also even in terms of class and, and background, it's, it's very, very mono, monocultural. Um, how much of these discussions are being heard or are taking place um, at the, the discussion level when we talk about the DSA? Yeah, well, certainly um, the, the, the DSA is, um, yeah, how to put it. So, uh, of course, you're right. <laughs> um, and that's uh, why it's so important that um, members who are involved in the process um, of lawmaking uh, listen to as many stakeholders as possible, especially from civil society. And I'm trying to do it. When I was drafting my um, initiative report with uh, legislative suggestions to the commission on the DSA, uh, I always tried to balance um, the, the stakeholder meetings. So, of course, there was a lot of lobby interest, but civil society, for example, was in the beginning quite, quite silence so uh, it was necessary to motivate them so that we can take really on board all perspectives and i think this is really important to to do it and i think um when when we um when we uh take a look for example what happened uh, during the last week in hungary um so with the lgbt uh, lgbt uh, law there uh and, and Orban's, uh take to make illegal the promotion of perceived LGBT content. Um, I wonder really what this does uh, to the DSA or with uh, the DSA. So we want to create a common framework for the takedown of legal content, which is important. But of course, different things are illegal in different countries. So my worst fear is that Hungary will be able to abuse the DSA, for example, to enforce its terrible laws such as this one and will order the takedown of LGBT related content. And as long as we cannot be sure about the rule of law uh, in uh, all EU member states, how much power do we really want to create uh, and give to member states to delete content at will. So, and this is only one example where it's very necessary to um, not only look, for example, at marketplaces, but really take into account what this law uh, can do to our societies, how uh, we live together. And at the moment, it's it's really focused on the discussion on, on marketplaces. So even the DSA. So it, the DSA was intended by the commission uh, for, yeah, mostly for social media platforms, but now the IMCO committee, so the internal market committee uh, is now responsible for it as the lead committee. And we really see a shift in the debate uh, to questions of the internal market and, and how um, trading platforms like Amazon, eBay should trade their customers. And I think this is uh, unfortunately um, very, how do you say, one, one dimensional maybe. So uh, it's, it's not, yeah, I, I'm a little disappointed at the moment. Well, uh, thank you, Timo. And you've actually, I think, in some ways answered a couple of questions that have come up from our audience members in the Q&A. One asking uh, how you managed uh, illegal speech and content moderation at EU level when national legislations are so, so diverse. So I, I think uh, if we haven't necessarily answered it, but we have certainly uh, identified that that is an issue. Um, also, uh, the question was, how do we make sure that states remain the duty bearers for protecting fundamental rights and not large organizations? Again, I think we've covered that to a degree. Brandeis, however, let me come back to you. I saw you nodding at what Timo was saying. Can you can you explain to me what, what's your reaction to, to what his, his views were? Yeah, so I was nodding because there is this concentration on how to make content moderation doable for companies. And there's not a conversation about how content moderation is 
received or doable for society and for people. And so I, I, was, I was nodding because I was like, yes, this is where the conversation is in the United States as well. It's very focused on the, the companies, which aren't in US terms, human beings, right? They're legalized people, entities, but they're not natural human beings. Um, but yet they seem to get priority over the citizens. And it seems that link is very much transatlantic, very similar. And it is, as, as Timo was saying, it's disappointing that we, we, we don't prioritize people. Instead of for calling um, users, users call them people because now you're trying to bring in that human impact. And, and that's where um, I think both sets of our, our legal system um, possibly need to refocus and strongly consider refocusing because people came first. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> so isn't it supposed, are we supposed to do these government things to help people <laughs> and not organizations and not companies? I don't know. It's a crazy idea. In theory, Brandeis, wouldn't it be lovely if the world <laughs> was like that? I mean, I'm struck by the fact that we talk about stakeholders and, and lobbying. Um, and then it's, it, there's an awful lot of weight is put to bear on the poor old civil society representatives because as though one small organization defending digital rights has got the same clout as any of the big international tech companies that we won't name. Who were Exactly. Invited... <laughs> That's exactly my point. Yeah. Who were invited can today just... and were not able to make it. Shakira, yes. Can I just add a point to what Dr. Marshall was saying about how legislation or these conversations seem to be um, slated towards the businesses and their capacity? Platforms have enough money to um, take a less cost-effective approach to content moderation. The things that um, Christina Dinar had laid out in her report are kind of three levels, and the more nuanced ones cost more money. Um, I think the important piece of that is that not only do they have enough money, but we as the people or the users have paid for that. Right. They sell our information to make profits. And so we at least are owed that much. Well, Christina, um, let's build upon what, what Shakira there and Brandes have been saying in terms of content moderation and the nuance that is possible. And I know you, you've worked with Wikimedia. Tell me about other alternative methods of content moderation that could be done if one had the will and the uh, incentives to do it rather than just looking at the bottom line. Yeah, this is very interesting. Also, I would say I stimme. It's a very interesting uh, question. I completely agree with the other panelists, especially as far as the money is concerned. They're earning lots and lots of money and they should be willing to pay for good content moderation. That is really the first thing I have to say. I've been working with Wikimedia and my task was is to increase the, the number of women uh, and because of the uh, indecision structure of Wikipedia. And I've really looked intensely into it, how we can become, how they could become more diverse because even Wikipedia is not just a dream, it's not a dream project. They also have problems with uh, equity, with equality, with diversity. It's still the fifth biggest web page in the world. And it's the only uh, one in those top five websites that serves the public interest. That is a voluntary project, even in content moderation, because this is what the Wikipedians all do themselves. And that's another interesting aspect that we have open data and that it's all being very transparent, that we know what's working well and what isn't, which is why I always introduce the thought as well that communities can do lots of things themselves and can be accompanied with that as well. And I'm, I've always been a fan of community management. And that's just something that's also coming from the US, is coming straight out of community organization of the townships and the, the question of how 
you can empower neighborhoods again, how communities can empower themselves again. And that's the same approach you can use for these kind of online spaces. If there is the support for that, there can be self-determination and that everyone participates. That's is also not complete in Wikipedia. There's a lot of work still left to be done, but it is possible. And there's another thing I would like to mention that's because it's very important to me. As far as content moderation is concerned, if we're talking about volunteers, because this is unpaid work. And this is something that is no longer the case in content moderation centers, but they're also not looking at quality. They have different models that I've mentioned in the report, but the situation is that these people are not in the greatest situation to phrase it carefully. And I think we could also help the people who work in those centers and the platforms themselves are responsible for these industrial centers they have created. Well, um, I want to also bring in, there was a comment here, or a question rather coming from our audience from uh, Hannah Lichtenheller, um, asking what the panel thinks about new projects like H.E.R.D. that are labeled as new feminist social media app, promising safe spaces for those marginalized and in danger of digital violence. I think I'd like to tie that to what Christina was saying about volunteers. Um, we can create alternatives and perhaps create, um, you know, uh, situations where a lot of those who are being marginalized, who are on the fringes, have the, if you like, the workload thrust back onto them to, you know, go away and create your own space because the mainstream isn't going to accommodate you. I mean, how helpful is that? I mean, while it's great to have these spaces, while it's great that people do care and will volunteer, shouldn't really the onus be on the big dominant platforms to, to make these communities intrinsic to their work ethos? Um, so, you know, basically, would more black women working behind the scenes representation give us better platforms on the, out, on the, on the outside end? Uh, Brandeis, uh, perhaps you could answer that one first for me and then I'll come to the other panel members. Yeah, I mean, this is always a debate, right, of how to be inclusive. But let me step back a second and say, all these systems were not designed with black women in mind. So these, these systems were not designed with LGBTQ plus IA individuals in mind either. They were not designed for women, <laughs> right? These, these systems were not designed for us. So the necessity to create a separate enterprise that sits under a larger platform is our way of survival, our way of navigating inside of these spaces and to maintain our joy and to share our joy and to comfort each other. So I think on one hand, they're necessary. And at the same time, it's very sad that they have to be necessary. Now, in response to you know, having more representation of black women in, in tech jobs or even in oversight um, positions, how to do that within. I think that it really does go back to um, requiring an intentional organizational shift. And that does mean top down. And that does require that the top have some come to whomever you worship moment. <laughs> Um, there needs to be readings. I mean, centering Black femme theory, Black femme thoughts, centering LGBTQ plus um, communities um, in the readings and the understandings, I think is Im important. Black women can only do so much because of the way society perceives us as volunteers, as in servitude. Right, it's very similar in LGBTQIA um, plus communities of unfortunately being sex workers, right? So these tropes are in our society physically and they get transferred into the online community. So in order for black women, in order to have that representation, that means power has to shift to them, which means not only are we in the conversation, but there's more than one of us. 
And with more than one of us, you actually listen to what we say. And then not only listen, but then do what we tell you to do. When we tell you there's a harm, you act. You don't wait, you don't ask for 50 gazillion different evidences in order to prove our point. You don't wait a year or five years in order to act. You act now. All this concern about how to deal with liability of an organization, wringing hands, taking a whole bunch of time away from actually doing content moderation, um, bills and proposals is an issue. So black women can be helpful, but we're not the hinge point. The hinge point still is the dominant community. It still means that the dominant community has to decide that they are no longer going to intentionally harm black women or intentionally harm LGBT, LGBTQIA plus communities. That is where we need to start. What is the dominant community doing? Everybody else is doing work. It's time for the dominant communities, the dominant cultures to start to come in and do their work. Put, roll up the sleeves and get to work. Don't be waiting for everybody else to do work. I'm gonna get off my soapbox now. <laughs> it was a very nice soapbox though, so we're, we're pretty pleased with it. Um, Shakira, uh, same question to you. What do you think of these, if you like, parallel platforms? And what do you consider the, the, you know, how do you, what's your take on the necessity, if you like, that we have volunteers or parallel platforms, or are you uh, chiming with what, as Bandai says, it, it, the onus is still on those dominant platforms, dominant communities uh, to actually do the work? Uh, both and, um, I'm not actually familiar with the, with the um, platform that you mentioned as an alternative. Um, but as someone who engages those types of platforms, right, there's certainly a necessary amount of relief to show up and not have to um, police yourself. I think that's something that has come up and been consistent in um, other kinds of reporting in our orbit is that one of the effects of content moderation is that folks start to present in a way to avoid uh, being censored, right? And then are not being their most authentic or full selves, which, right, as just um, a reproduction of how folks experience uh, real life. Um, but towards the piece about diversity um, and it being right, basically dominant folks' work to do, uh, I certainly agree with that. Um, I really like. Um, the idea, I guess the philosophy of community-centered um, moderation, as Christina was saying with Wikipedia, and who has time to volunteer, right? Like who has um, unpaid hours to contribute to a project? Folks who have money already, folks who already have privilege, and in a way that just recreates, I think, some of the issues that we're already seeing. As far as it being on bigger platforms to make a shift, uh, I'm not certain what incentive there is for that decision, right? I think in global capitalism and um, in a venue where companies and platforms are worth a lot of money and they are making lots of money and doing what they've been doing and that's been just fine for them despite some bad PR, uh, the incentive is money. Either that it costs them money to um, perpetuate said harms or they are um, rewarded with funds in some way, I suppose, to have the representation that's needed uh, to facilitate the change and the safety that we're trying to see. If I could chime in um, to say one other point, and when it, everything Shakira said, <laughs> everything um, that she said, in addition to the penalty that these laws have is always monetary. 5%, 6% of revenue, it's, it doesn't hurt them. But yet the people harm or hurted in a way that is sometimes not able to be recovered from. 
right? So thinking through this notion of volunteerism that's necessary for the oppressed to endure, coupled with a small monetary slap on the wrist is introducing additional harm because the money doesn't go to those who are harmed. It doesn't go toward the civic organizations that have the volunteers that possibly could pay them some money so that there isn't this cyclic, right? Classist, elitist organization, right? And infrastructure. So reimagining how we deal with that regulation reimagining how we see that volunteerism is classes and we need to move away from volunteerism and ensure that the monies that are collected are actually going to organizations that are doing that work. And then increasing the amount of money and possibly increasing different types of criminal acts, right? That a person can be banned from a platform. Why can't a platform be banned from the people? Yeah, take them offline for a week or two, hit them <laughs> hard. <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> let's see what mechanisms are available to do that. I mean, one thing I want to get, I mean, my soapbox is always very much the same, which is that perhaps we need to address the business model underlying the sorts of content we consume. Um, I'm, I tend to bring everything a bit back to data protection, but the programmatic advertising business model that drives these platforms is inherently problematic if you are just rewarding increasingly damaging content, be that extremist of any nature, but it's also extremist and hate field content. So, and I, I wonder how much any of you think that, um, yeah, I was going to come to you first, Christina, changing the business model would actually go some way to solving these uh, these problems rather than just trying to slap down the, the problems once they've happened. Christina. Yeah, I, I just want to add, I mean, uh, great conversation and thanks for all the adding on the volunteer work. I agree very much. I think that I said before, I want to speak about enhancing and putting money to enhance good practice. None of the laws right now on the table, not the one in Germany has ever thought about that. So, but what I wanted to introduce, sorry, Jennifer, that's why I jumped on is, hey, Timo, that's why I'm thinking the whole time about this platform, how to like make them social Democrats, like to, to make them more like this, this, this core of the social Democrats that have to say, oh, we have to have a big of market, but we also have to be social uh, to com combine the tone. So I, I just, want to introduce this idea to you. What do you think about that? That we need social democratic uh, platforms. Go ahead, Timo. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So yes, of course, um, we need these uh, platforms and we need them to be uh, yeah, democratic and, and social. And um, so community-based platforms are, from my perspective, a very good idea. So um, these platforms are, uh, in, or well, should be intended for uh, people who exchange, who meet, who discuss, and not for uh, the revenue of, of the companies. And um, I think we need to make sure that um, these are actually compatible with the DSA. So we need to make sure that community-based uh, com um, uh, platforms um, will not be heard uh, by the DSA, which is, um, well, which could happen. And I'm going to look at the um, current, uh, the yeah, current, um, uh, sorry, moderation practices um, in the DSA to this end to make sure that, um, yeah, community driven moderation will be uh, possible. So this is, um, and for that, I think interoperability is also very important so that you can have an exchange between different platforms. So for example, all your friends or coworkers are on one platform, but you don't like the atmosphere on this platform anymore because it's, well, it, it's hurting you or it's hurting, uh, it's damaging you in any kind. So then why can't you just 
uh, switch the network, uh, the the social platform. But via interoperability, uh, be still connected to your friends. So sometimes you need to stay on the platform to to get the information you're looking for. And I think we need to overcome this. And maybe one quick thought on on Jennifer on on your question on the business model. So this was one of my, oh yeah, my main focus in my initiative report and the European Parliament in the end in my report supported by a majority, it was not the biggest majority ever, but at least we had a majority uh, calling on the commission to phase out personalized uh, targeted advertisements um, as they are uh, what I, and I truly believe that are harmful for us in, uh, um, for us as um, platforms collect our information just to sell advertisements and they um, choose content which is presented to us just to keep us longer on the platform, uh, just to keep us on the platform to sell more advertisements. And of course they are presenting content which they think would, uh, would um, attract us to stay longer on the platform. And it's not boring scientific content. It's most likely dangerous content, um, entertaining content. Um, but uh, sometimes, or very often, unfortunately, it's also harmful, not illegal, but harmful content. So um, this is where I think the business model has a real influence um, on which content we, we see. And this is, uh, I think, really toxic and we need to get rid of it. And this is um, my main proposal. Unfortunately, at the moment, uh, no, unfortunately, the commission did, didn't take uh, this proposal up in their draft. But as uh, the discussions uh, in the parliament continue, I hope that we will reintroduce um, <laughs> this, yeah, this getting rid of personalized advertisements and hence um, making the business model more sustainable and yeah, social again. And hopefully as well, as Christina was flagging up, promoting better methods and better content and so on. Um, we are down to our last two minutes. So ladies, um, since, since we've just heard from Timo, Shakira, can you give me a sort of closing takeaway in 30 seconds? That's a tough ask, I'm aware. Wow, no pressure. Um, I think just bouncing off of what Timo was saying about um, the unsustainability of this model and I think also the exploitative nature of the model and how you make an argument to make it less so um, is that it's kind of keeping in mind that the internet, that these platforms um, are now our public square, right? And it is not democratic to collect and sell right, our conversations about democracy or experience or charge some kind of entry fee uh, or some identity hierarchy of how to participate in our democratic interactions. Uh, Christina, your quick closing thoughts? Yeah, invest in community management and pay these people to work with this, pay them well and like, roll up the sleeves, as Brandeis says, that they do that work. Uh, there is enough out there. Vielen Dank. Danke. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Brandeis, I'm going to give the last word to you, but it's going to have to be brief. And instead of reflecting what we did talk about, I know we missed out everything in one hour. What, what were the big areas that we forgot to talk about today that we're going to have to organize another event for? Oh, you want to talk about what, what are the next steps? Yep, what are the next steps? <laughs> um, I think next steps is uh, read the e-papers. Um, engage in, in your uh, civil society in your local area. This is global. I think third is always intention over um, the, the, sorry, it's always, a, it's always a matter of trying to make sure that you are doing um, impact and that is superseding intention. So get to work, everybody. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, <laughs> This has been wonderful. Well, thank you, Brandis, as well. And thank you, Shakira, Timo, and Christina, and as well, Sora uh, and Sabine for helping to organize this, as well as our excellent translators and the audience 
for your questions, which we couldn't get to. Some of them were a bit, a little bit long and a bit confusing, so I couldn't answer, attempt to get to all of them. But I hope we touched on many of the main points, transparency, interoperability, legislation, the internet as a commons, network effects, all of that I think we've covered amazingly well in the space of just one hour, which has been a really, really tough challenge. But I really thank you very much. I could could happily sit here and talk all evening with you because um, it's been really, really, really entertaining and engaging and important as well. But I hope we've managed to, to shake up people's evening on this Monday uh, evening here in Brussels, but morning, obviously, there in the US and also trying to draw the parallels that are happening on both sides of the Atlantic, because this isn't just a, a problem for people working on the DSA. This is a, a global issue that needs to be tackled on several different levels, I think. With that, I will say thank you, wish everyone a very good day and uh, say goodbye from me.